So good afternoon, everyone. Welcoming you to the presentation series where our 52 Parinde Fellows of the third cohort will be sharing their learnings, reflections, and insights from their journey. Hi, my name is Ashik Krishnan, and I'm one of the co-creators of Travelers University. The 52 Parinde Fellowship is a eight-month-long program for youth designed by Travelers University. It's a program for youth who are in the pursuit of their own livelihoods, livelihoods that are oriented towards social, ecological, and personal well-being. So each of them have had a journey of about five months where they traveled across the country and met with livelihood practitioners, people who are working in the domains of the interest of the fellows, uh, the kind of domain areas the fellows see as livelihood areas for themselves. So the fellows spend about two weeks with each of them, engaging in their work, involving in their work, thus having a direct learning experience for themselves. And for the last 10 days, we have been having our reflection process reflecting on the journey so far and with the intention to articulate the plans and ideas ahead. So this presentation is where the fellows will be sharing the, their major highlights of their journey. Uh, so right now we have Rahul Bora from Assam who explored the area of social emotional learning and arts sharing his journey with us. So Rahul Bora is a dedicated social entrepreneur hailing from Assam, passionately transforming the lives of children in low-income government schools. Rahul firmly believes in holistic education, recognizing that true growth extends far beyond mere grades, marks, and results. Hence, he established Thoughts to Action, an education organization to champion the cause of art education as a conduit to quality education, empowering young minds to discover their creativity, resilience, and empathy. With a deep conviction in the power of art, Rahul embarked on a journey to instill social-emotional learning through artistic expression through the 52 Parinde Fellowship. Rahul traveled to different states in India and met with people to understand the intersection of social emotional learning and arts, and also understand the profound connection it builds to deepen his own understanding of what was happening in the other art education spaces and how these spaces were being facilitated. So here is a peek into the journey that Rahul had. And yes, over to you, Rahul. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vasik. And I would also like to thank the team of Travelers University to also allow me, uh, given me this opportunity to actually explore into the domain uh, of social emotional learning and art. Uh, art has been a very personal journey for me. Like uh, I remember when I was in school, I was a very average uh, student who actually struggled mm -hmm. to get good marks or have been with friends who actually scored good marks. And it was those times I felt very low within myself. Maybe I am not good enough or maybe I am not uh, good in studies. And art has always been that tool for me where I have uh, used to express my emotions, feelings, and my thoughts into it. And art has always been there in that way for me. And that's where uh, art became very personal uh, in my whole journey of life. And in 2019, I completed my uh, post graduation. Uh, I did my master's in social work. And during those time, I think I realized more powerfully and it came to me more powerfully that how art can be a tool to use uh, to access a lot of emotions, feelings, thoughts, features, goals, and and that's where in 2019, I started with a community learning center where I worked with children from uh, these states, Adivasi children. And I was just using art and crafts as a museum to teach them 
education and just maybe not education but rather to build their motor skills and imaginations into it and uh, we ran that program for one year and i realized or i observed among the children that uh, they were getting more expressive in manner when when they were doing arts and doing crafts and they were also becoming very confident in doing what they were doing and that was that point that i felt more strongly or more confident towards that i need to take this whole journey more seriously and i wanted to learn uh, different forms of art which can help in a person's journey to actually make it smoother rather would say and that's when i uh, started this organization called thoughts to action and through which we try to work with government schools currently and using art as a medium to teach them social emotional learning and i think uh, when i saw this opportunity of 52 uh, per in the fellowship where it allowed or it was giving an opportunity to travel and meet different people in your journey and it was that one thing that came to my mind that i need to visit more people to actually understand its uh, components and intersections of social emotional learning and art and the journey started in that way and i visited uh, subham as my first parinde and it was uh, interesting to meet her in the way that uh, she uses dance movement therapy as a tool to actually use your body and talk about social emotional learning and it was for the first time that i realized that our body can also be a tool it's a communication tool that can be used to actually understand so express your uh, emotions feelings thoughts and that was when i encountered dance and your body as a tool of uh, sharing a lot of emotions and i did i met a lot of people there over there when it was powerful to actually listen to their reflection after when you move your body with touch your body with one another and how those emotions goes goes within yourself i think that was powerful and later i realized that i need to understand more about uh, the stakeholders which are also there in the ecosystem like the parents the teachers and the whole education system in that way so i traveled to majuli after this uh, in assam and maybe yeah before going to majuli i can i would like to give in this contact of uh, this kids that i made in uh, delhi so suvam introduced me to this uh, group of uh, children uh, they call this place creativity atta where it was an after school program basically so they were coming and learning different kinds of art forms music dance uh, art and many other and i told suvam that ki can we can i also interact with the children and do something with that and this was this session where i took a uh, session on self confidence how do you how do you actually understand your emotions and how do, does it makes you confident about sharing your emotions and this was a beautiful moment that i uh, had with these kids in delhi and then walking here i realized that i also need to understand the whole ecosystem or the stakeholders who are also responsible uh, for this whole system so that's when i travel to majuli after this and uh, in majuli i actually try to interact with the teachers the parents about what do you understand by social emotional learning or is it why is it important you think that art base education should be introduced in schools and i think i remember this conversation having with the parents that and even back in when i was uh, working with this community so this community learning center that the responses that came from the parents were that my child doesn't know to do painting this that why don't you teach them art and art was just conventional art that you draw in a board and then they just copy it i think that's where i realized that it's important to actually convey the message to the parents and the teachers facilitators who are actually actually facilitating journey for the children and uh, the common thing what came out from there that my child is not an artist or maybe i'm not an artist and that's where maybe this triggered me very uh, strongly that how do we convince the parents and this was when in majuli we uh, this was this organization called sunbird trust uh, who was actually trying to set up uh, their partner schools in majuli and this is where we had this interaction with the parents uh, that why art based education is important for children and i remember having this conversation also with my parinde saying why art is important so let me give you a context of two children 
how art based education helps the children also in their academics imagine two child who actually passed out uh, who appeared exam of who appeared exam and failed in that exam and the child who was not able to actually manage his emotions did not understand his emotion actually took some steps which was not it was harming the child and it was not able to accept how accept the failures and the situation around which was happening and on the other hand imagine a child who actually understands his emotions able to uh, navigate his emotions what is he feeling and how would that child address that situation of failure and that's where we felt it is important to tell the parents to understand that we are not making them artists or painter rather not artists but we are not making them painters but rather an architect of their own life how to take their life ahead smoothly then i uh, also wanted to understand the spaces how art was being uh, facilitated so, so that's where i traveled to guwahati to meet this uh, person uh, khairul bachar so who is actually running an intergenerational space of art so this space was very interesting to see because uh, there were uh, 60 years old people was also coming to art there were 6 years old kids who was also painting at the same time and the dialogues which were happening among them so it was very powerful to see uh how art is also leading to dialogues how art is also leading to uh, conversations and building narratives of lives that we have and that's why i found is very interesting space to travel and understand how dialogues also comes in when we are interacting with our emotions and feelings and uh, after this i travel uh, to meet nilim uh, who is a graffiti artist and it was also interesting to see him because he was using art as a tool to raise out community issues so this is a painting that he has done of uh, bishnu prasad rawha but uh, in his dialogue i found there was an incision that he shared with me uh, this is if you can see this is a flyover that he painted so so there were many flyovers which was being constructed in guwahati and still going on in many places of course there are many constructions are happening and in one of this construction and there was a walker who got met with an accident uh, while walking and the person just uh, took up his vehicle on his feet and just ran away and did not this case did not even highlighted got highlighted and nilim so happened to be there in that place he had a conversation with that person talked about him, uh, his feelings what was he feeling and he drew this whole incident of uh what the person was feeling the victimized person that how he was being attacked and he drew in in one of the flyover uh in guwahati and then later it became an issue uh for the community that uh, it was an issue that got highlighted so the a tool of art and i think that was powerful to see when his way of thinking and communication that how art can also be a tool for addressing uh, communities issues and how art can also be a tool of uh, expressing what you are feeling and i think that was what i was also looking into my whole journey to understand how art can be used into different spaces and as i was also working in school setup now currently so i wanted to understand more deeply now into the education system of the children how it is impacting in their uh, whole education system so then i travel to bangalore uh, and met uh, digya sa and she is working into uh, social emotional learning and art um, in schools in low income uh, schools where they were they were trying to address they have been using many tools like poetry uh, theater visual arts to actually address social emotional learning of children and i think uh, i have witnessed different kinds of people in this journey uh, who have been using art as a tool in many spaces uh, from community spaces to school settings then to public spaces and i think my journey was into that uh, of finding how art helps a person to actually freely think about uh, and that was my whole curiosity maybe towards in the journey and i think meeting these children while uh, 
going into the schools with Jigyasa, one thing that uh, pop up with me in my mind was that there are no bad arts. And conventionally, what we say, good arts, I think there is no good art, there is no bad art. It just is the attempt of trying to do something is art, I believe, what I have, it has immersed for me in this journey. And that's where I thank the whole people that I have met in this journey. And it was a very diverse, uh, I feel my journey has been in that uh, way, understanding. Asik, if you can go to the next slide. Like in this journey actually helped me to uh, understand from different angles, uh, from the parents, facilitators, teachers, the children who are actually benefiting out of it. And community as large that how they have been taking art. And I think this question still lies on me that how do we can make it more approaching or maybe how do we take it to the facilitators that you don't need to really be an artist to actually do painting or art. It's just expression of your emotions, feelings, thought, and understanding that whole uh, social dynamics, I believe. And that's where this whole uh, journey of mine lies behind this of now. Uh, I've been working into government schools for now two, three years, and climate change has been a topic or an issue that has been bothering me uh, for a long time. And this journey actually helped me to understand that how art can be taken as a tool to address so many other issues in the community. And now I feel that I want to go back and work on uh, stories of uh, climate change into education, how uh, environmental education can be enhanced, rather not be more of theoretical, rather how can we bring more and more holistic stories and then can become as a tool for more learning. And I think my journey would be now more into how can I use comics or art in stories of uh, climate change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul, for sharing. And now we open for you and Day. Um, so this presentation is happening in, like in a hybrid manner. There are like people sitting in the room, like same as Rahul is sitting, and uh, and also people are joined via Zoom. Um, yeah, so for both the groups, like this is a time to ask questions or like. To Rahul, which he he he, he, might, he might address, uh, but also you can also share your own thoughts and reflections on the idea of uh, or in, in the on the intersection of social emotional learning and arts as well. So opening up the space for that. So the, those who are joined via Zoom, you can unmute yourselves and speak or ask. Uh, hi everyone, uh, Shruti here. Hi Rahul. Hi Shruti. Hi Shruti. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that is, um, I would like to understand and uh, get an insight into how your inner journey was during um, this travel of yours. Like just a brief into it. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Shruti, for this question. I believe, of course, the journey has been definitely ups and downs. And I was also confused in between the journey because uh, there have been different people that I met and there were different ways how people were using art. And the confusion that uh, rise on me was that how do I go back and use art for me again? Uh, the schools that I was working in. And I think the journey sum up uh, very smoothly in that matter because I met this uh, comic artist 
uh, towards the end of my journey, uh, Indrajit Sinha, so who was actually using comics as a tools to narrating, uh, storytelling, or comic, uh, comics as a tools to also tell stories to children in the schools. I think that brought a whole journey into, uh, what do I say, all of my emotions or all of my understandings into an graphic mode. And I think uh, that also again helped me to navigate my whole journey. Internally, of course, it was very disturbing, confusing rather, I would say, uh, at some point when I was uh, going through, because these are different kinds of art forms that I was uh, witnessing in the journey. But yeah, if I have to sum up, I would say that uh, comics actually helped me to also narrate my whole story. Okay. Suti, so does that answer Should your we... question or you may also ask a follow-up question to that? Well, um, yeah, it, it partially does. So I think I can come back to it. Uh, there are also more questions uh, which are awaiting. In... Yes, yes. Uh, so there are like two questions that have come up. Uh, so first one is by Gurveen. Uh, the question is, would you say any one medium is superior to another for certain age groups? For example, do younger children like or relate better than older children or adults to particular mediums? Uh, thank you, uh, Gurveen, for this uh, question. But I feel art is a very uh, free flow uh, tool it can be used by any children and there is no superior in that matter i feel what i have witnessed because for me uh using my body was never i witnessed in my life but that did not even feel uncomfortable for me at this uh, at the same time when i also was working with industry into comics that was also something new for me to uh put my story down in a comics format but i didn't feel uh, the superior or other any uh, differences in those forms because it was just expression of my feelings. But yes, you can say that key which was more comfortable for me, whether it was sketching was comfortable for me or it was body movements was comfortable for me. I think everyone has that own uh, strength within them, whether it's painting, sketching, music, dance, or any other art form, filmmaking in that matter. So I think it's... Uh, the tool, we need to understand what is my skill, or we can also develop our skills, of course, in that way. Uh, what is the tool that actually helps me to express my emotions? And personally, I also uh, play music or play guitar to express my emotions. So at times it differs. What is the uh, medium that I also have uh, with me? Uh, when I'm traveling, I did not have my guitar with me. So definitely, I had to take a different uh, medium to express my emotions or thoughts which was there. So I think it's just that tool which is available to you and also what we feel maybe, but can be used in any way. That's what I feel. Okay. Uh, there's, there's one more question in the comments uh, by Divya. Rahul, great to learn about your journey. Can you share more about the dance arts part of it? And I would like to know whether it was only for children or for adults as well. I think she's referring to the dance movement therapy uh, practice with Subhan. Uh, thank you, Dibya, for this question. I think uh, art actually makes us children. It's uh, whether we are adult or children, it actually takes us to that whole memory of children and be fun, playful. Uh, so, Dance works with everyone, like I said before. It is a tool, how do we use it for ourselves? And if dance is your strength, then definitely dance can be a tool for uh, expression of medium. And I feel dance can also be... I have worked with, when I was with Shubham, I worked with young people and adults. But I feel dance can also be used with children very beautifully. Okay, okay. So did we try to ask that the Parinde that I met in Delhi, so was it she walking with young people or was it she also walking with children? So uh, Subham is a freelancer. 
she actually works with corporates, she works with NGOs, she works uh, with young people, children. So she also does this festival called, uh, called Aham Festival, so which is actually open to everyone. And where it's not just only about dance, it's also more about uh, many tools which actually help you to, there are also games which also helps you to uh, share out your emotions. Is that answer the question, Divya? Okay, Gurbin has responded. I understand as I listen to you how your journey is widened. But how would you say how your quest has deepened? That's a follow up question. Now. Uh, Rahul, you're on mute. Oh, if you're speaking. Yes, Asik. Yeah. Uh, I was actually also trying to understand the question for me. Uh, so she's saying, okay, from, from whatever you, that you shared, we understand that your journey has, or your exploration has widened, like it has become broad, but how has it deepened? Like where has it gone like deeper or narrowed or streamlined? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gurmin. Uh, I also share like one or two uh, anecdotes, like actual instances from the journey which would help address the question. Okay. I think it uh, it was interesting to uh, observe or meet the parents and the teachers because uh, they gave me a different understanding of how they were looking into education in general, like uh, scoring marks, getting good marks or passing your exams. But rather, we were trying to use as a tool of expression or sharing our thoughts and imaginations. And I think that was the point where I realized that it's uh, it cannot be work in an isolated manner. Like it would rather create a parallel system. Like the current education system is going in a different way, and we would be trying a different way. I think uh, that was my understanding that how do we uh, bring that participation from that whole uh, ecosystem? It's not just that we are working, but rather how participatory, modely, how can we work? I think that was my takeaway from this whole journey. I, if I'm not, uh, can I, uh, have I answered your question, Gurmeen? Is that what you wanted to know? Uh, more or less, yes. But I think I'm looking for something, what, what remain as, questions for you at the end of your journey. It doesn't have to be a solution, but what are the questions that you'd further like to follow up and which have come uh, from your start, but have not perhaps yet been answered? <laughs> Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the question of how can we make art education or art-based education more acceptable for people. Uh, the question was still bothering me when uh, people were not trying to accept, no, because uh, I have been working into art education for now uh, two, three years, or my personal journey has also been into that way. So when I met people, people have seen that uh, way as well. Ki you do painting, you do sketching, that's why it is easy, easier for you to do in this way. Uh, but what about people who doesn't know to paint or who doesn't know to even sketch? How would how would it be for them to facilitate sessions for children? I think that has been bothering within me. And that's why I wanted to... Uh, maybe huh, the quest is on that. Ki how do art education be made more accessible or more acceptable for people that it just becomes a part of our life, not just rather see it as an alternative education?
So the question Shruti posed like has like something similar to what uh, is related to what you just shared right now. Um, have you come across a situation where the children or adults have trouble expressing through a particular medium of art? Let's say painting. How do you think one shall be able to identify what other form of arts, say dance or singing, uh, would that individual be comfortable in? Okay. I think this challenge has been also into the current education system that our learning methods are not individualized learning methods. These are group learning methods which we are doing. And the challenge also lies here similarly, of course. But uh, with art, what I have realized, what Suti is asking, I can also understand that that topic key. When it is a group learning, of course, it becomes difficult. And our current education system is doing the same, that we are not individualizedly teaching children. It's a, in fact, group learning. And even if in this situations, also I feel the same when we are trying, or let's say when we are taking painting as a medium to express, not every child is comfortable in painting. But that's what maybe the quest was also, how do we make art-based education more accessible? And also we as a facilitator, when we are working into it, understand different forms of art, what might work for children or maybe in uh, any individual in that matter. And for adults, I don't know, this is an assumption that I'm making, I, uh, that it becomes easier to understand what I'm good at, but for children, of course, how do we facilitate this is also a question that I would also uh, looking for. But thank you, Sruti, for this question. There's another question in the comments by Aditya. What were some things that amazed you during the course of this journey? Hmm. What amazed me was meeting uh, uh, my parinis, of course, they were Parindas who became or started the journey accidentally, like they didn't want it to be art facilitator, but they became in the journey art facilitator. And there were people who are uh, actually connected with their own lives, uh, have been using art as a form of expression. And that's where they continued this journey. And I think seeing the diverse uh, journey of people was actually amazing for me to also witness within this journey how someone just accidentally became an entrepreneur or has been working in today's, or someone only just know art or comics as a way of expression, that's why they are going into this. So that diversity of people being getting into this uh, medium or maybe in this domain also amazed me in the journey. Okay, there's a question from Susudan from the room. Your travel map shows your journey was intense. How was the traveling experience for you? The traveling experience. I think uh, if you look at my map, my journey has been very long. Uh, from Bangalore, I started to Delhi, again from Delhi to Assam, from Assam to Bangalore. I think it was, most of my time was in the train. Uh, two, three day journey it was in the train. So I met different kinds of people in the train as well. So there were a lot of dialogues that happened in the train. So in that way, I would rather say, uh, I also explored the whole uh, conversations uh, that I that was happening in different states that I was in, you know, so in the train, of course, what I'm saying. Like from Delhi to Assam when I went, there were different kinds of conversations happening in different parts. When I reached Bihar, when I reached West Bengal. So things were also changing. Uh, dynamics were changing. So that was interesting. But yes, I have loved train journey now. I, would, yeah, I can say that from this journey.
so there is a question saying that uh, what challenges have I seen uh, in the journey where art educators were actually facing? How to facilitate uh, in the process of facilitating to children? Uh, I think uh, the challenge that I saw was even that was witnessed in uh, Shruti's question as well. That how do we make individualized learning, not rather a group learning? How can one understand that painting is not my way of expression but rather dance or singing is my way of expression so i think that was also evident or uh, was something that i witnessed the facilitators were also uh, finding it difficult to actually do individualized learning instead of group learning i think that has been a challenge in my journey when i met them and interacted with them and for many of course it was also a challenge that our uh, painting is for the first time that i'm doing and if I am not as a facilitator confident in doing it, how would rather I would facilitate for children? So that was also something that I witnessed. Mm. So that the challenge that you mentioned is like more in terms of the domain area of your exploration within the subject, within the realm of the area of your exploration. Uh, but uh, were there any other personal challenges or you no know, conflicts that you came up with during the journey? Uh, sorry, sorry, Asik. So this question was actually from the room that I uh, responded to it. So the yeah. question was that, what were the challenges uh, art facilitators were having while facilitating to children Got or it. any Got other it. target yes. groups? There's also a uh, similar question in the comment, but like there it says, what are the major challenges you have faced during your entire journey? Uh, so if you could also share like uh, if there were any personal challenges or personal other any other forms of conflicts that uh, you came up with during the journey. Uh, I didn't see as a challenges, uh, but uh, in fact I felt comfortable because art uh, art was itself is a language because I went to stage where maybe I was not comfortable with the language but uh, art also helped me to actually uh, communicate in that matter so in that way maybe I would say it was not a challenge but rather I encountered different kinds of situations uh, I would like to put it in that way If there are any you know, instances or anecdotes that you might want to share on that. Uh, examples like maybe see where, where, when I was in Bangalore and I went to the schools, uh, it was getting difficult to communicate like what I want to communicate because before the sessions I was talking to them, I have come from here. And these were low-income schools, so they didn't even understood English as well. And Hindi was getting difficult for everyone to understand. So I drew in the board saying this is what I mean. And I think that's where the, the, this was something that I share, uh, wanted to put it forward. Ki art became actually a tool for me for communication. So rather I saw that as an opportunity ki how that art actually bought, uh, helped me to actually express what he there's another question from Gurveen in the comments. Uh, what, if anything, would you wish you had done differently or wished for? What I would have done differently, maybe... Uh, there were a lot of people in my mind, even now, to meet and understand their form of art. And I think the journey in that way, because it was a time-bound journey, so I had that limitation that I could only meet uh, this number of people. And I think I would have done that differently. Uh, meet more people rather. Though it was diverse, of course, I understand I have taken very di uh, diverse uh, people to understand this journey. But uh, I still missed out the people who were actually decision maker in this journey. Like educator, not educators, like who, was, who is making policy into this art-based education or in general education system. I think I left that stakeholder from this whole system. And I would have, if I had more time or maybe if I had this opportunity, I can still do it, of course. That is, that would be my journey ahead. 
Okay, there's one more question in the comments by Aditya Singh. How do you see art as a livelihood in a world where jobs like, like IAS, engineering, doctor, lawyer, MBA are more preferred by parents or young people? Uh, thank you, Aditya, for this question. Uh, I think the people that I have met was also going through problems of this kind, like Art has definitely helped them to express, but in terms of livelihood or in terms of earning money has been an challenge because I don't know which an assumption that I would say again I'm making that we are not yet still ready to take art as a profession. It has instead been as a tool just for expression and it has all uh, it has still been uh how do I say like it's not that parents don't allow you to take art. It's for a certain period of time, they are okay with art. Okay, your board exams are coming, but before they thought, the art, you can go and learn art, you can go and do sports. But that narrative has, I think, still will take time to change. And these are my assumptions, of course, what I'm saying. But this has been my also experience meeting people. And I have taken the journey also into this. And there have been definitely challenges into it. How do you convince people that can be also a way of life? Similar like farming as well, I would rather say. So this, not as a solution, but rather what also Grumin asks, no? what differently could I have done? So that's why maybe in this whole process, I feel that that stakeholder was missing or had missed in my journey to understand who actually make policies and how do they look at art-based education from their perspective? So I have a question, Rahul. Uh, so your experience has largely been of you know, working with children, um, the organization that you're, you have founded and been working with for the last two or three years. And through the fellowship also, like most of the people whom you met were those who were, those who were working with children. Uh, but in Neelim's case, like uh, he was someone like who worked, like who, who like the graffiti artist uh, you mentioned, um, where through his art, he was trying to nudge the certain emotions or certain feelings or like off or in the general society uh, where like her, like his, the or, or like form or exp or, or expression is something that cuts across you no know, multiple age groups or um, classes. So how 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 do how do you look at that? Like how has like what kind of uh, an insight that you were able to draw from that experience of being with Neelim? Uh, meeting him was interesting in the sense i would say uh, that's what i had this communication with him that uh, he's comfortable with art he's not he doesn't know to do any other thing than art and that's why it was interesting to see how he has taken his art as a livelihood now also initially of course he was doing art for himself he uh, painted that issue that happened he also has done things before, similar before. And as it was in graffiti art, it was in the public and people started noticing, of course. And in one of that incident that happened, it highlighted him. And I think having conversation with him was that he wanted to bring revolution through his uh, brass. That's what we had this conversation with him. And I think that was so powerful for me to uh, take it back for me that how can a brass bring revolution to this whole uh, wall. And I think that has given me some sort of energy within my journey as well that ke, uh, it takes time to bring changes because what we are uh, trying to work is a behavioral changes that we are looking for or narrative changes in people. And when it is narrative changing or perspective building or behavioral changes, I think it's a process rather than some results uh, it will take time. That's what is my understanding into this journey. Okay, so then like, what is your idea of revolution? My idea of revolution, you mean to say? 
Yeah. I think that uh, my idea of revolution is that how can we be more aware about uh, what is happening around and how can we contribute uh, contribute towards it, whether in any form, whether it's art, is dance, or poem, or music, or stories, or also going out in the field and doing protests. I think these are all steps. For me, I would rather say what I am comfortable with doing. So that has been, or this is my idea of revolution. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Paul. There are, there's another question in the comments. What are some tips for traveling you would like to give to your fellow travelers after exploring this pedagogy of travel? Uh, I think uh, one thing was uh, it's allowed me to meet different kind of people from different uh, part of the states. And the culture was different. The social context were different. And I think that's what was also the confusion because of uh, in my journey towards later in the end was that I have met different kind of people and different cultures they were living in. And what is there for me to take from there? So I think finding that what we are looking for will be there for everyone. And a traveling trip, uh, tip rather if I have to say, uh, travel with less baggages or burden with you. Uh, here's a question coming that should we uh, be traveling less from within or from outside? So uh, I would rather say we need to be deeper within, of course, but in outside, we should be traveling very lightly. Maybe you can take like one or two more questions before we move to the next presentation. So uh, there has been a question from the room that uh, what has been my uh, food journey? Uh, I think I have spent most of my time in Bangalore now, like towards this out part. And I didn't know that I could survive without meat when I was in Assam or maybe in mountain areas. But my travel journey has been that. My narrative has also changed that uh, you actually need food or uh, just sufficient food to survive. And I have been surviving with very little. And also in my train journeys, I have taken many food, which has actually disturbed my journey. And that has been my takeaway that we can survive with very little, not little, but sufficient food. We'll just wait to see if there are any more questions coming up. Maybe one or two more and then we'll move to the next presentation. Uh, any more queries that you have?
or anything that you like to know more. Not necessarily has to be queries. Okay, I think we'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. And while we create space for the... Thank you so much, everyone, for listening so politely and also putting out your thoughts and questions to me. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. So while we create space for the next person to join, um, I would like to share a bit about the book that we have published. Uh, so this is a book that that has come up as an output of the first cohort of the fel uh, fellowship. Uh, so through the fellowship, like as the fellows meet with and learn from the different but in these are livelihood practitioners, people who you know carved out their own parts of livelihoods. The fellows also document their stories of like how they came to be doing what they're doing, uh, the values involved in their work, the knowledge and skill set and mindset that they uh, that they built to you know to create the kind of livelihoods and uh, for for themselves. So there's a collection of 51 stories that uh, have been documented by the fellows. Apart from these stories of the Allied practitioners, it also includes the fellows, their own learnings, reflections, and insights from the journey. Uh, and there's another section on separately dedicated to a livelihoods, um, where there are more detailed structured information on the different livelihoods that uh, the first cohort of fellows uh, explored or pursued. So I'm sharing the link of the uh, uh, of the web page like in the comments. Uh, those who wish to download can download it from from the website. And uh, if you would like to have a physical copy for yourself, uh, please write to us. Like the details are again in the in the same page, and we'd be happy to share a copy with you. Yes, I put the link in the comments. The next fellow who will be you know, presenting or sharing today is Vaishna. Vaishna had explored the domain of the impact of climate change and resilience of coastal communities. Vaishna is a professional social worker from the Kannur district of Kerala. She's specializing in community development and climate change impact mitigation. Vaishna is also an avid artist and loves spending time with colors. A lover of solo travel, each person she meets and interacts with, with on her journey is a life lesson for her. She has an equal passion for committing her skills to the society. She's someone who left her career in information technology sector to contribute to her community in an in-depth manner. And through the 52 Parinde Fellowship, Vaishna pursued the impact of climate change and other issues faced by coastal communities in India while looking at the intersections of caste and gender in these issues. The travel through the western coasts of India has been insightful for her to work towards a vision of working with coastal communities. And uh, here is a map. Here is a map of you know, Vaishna's travel. You can see that like, she has mostly traveled through the western coast of India. 
So yes, over to you, Vaishnav. Yeah, thank you, Ashik. Yeah, and good morning, or because we are facing first time in this platform, yo, I, so I am inviting all to the coastals of India, especially the Western coastals where I am so familiar with, and I, um, I did not my first uh part of my journey in my life journey as a lot I face lot I period because it, in that period I am finding myself I am not uh, I am not touching the beaches I am in the low, lower part of the sea and in this in that period I am sta I am starting to in, in finding myself uh, and I am working with uh, different kind of organizations they have uh, with different organizations, political parties, and NGOs who are uh, spending their time and effort with the coastal communities. So I I have little bit hope on them. So I started to work them, and they give me a big uh, big window of how the coastal is and what the problem they are facing, especially in the Kerala coastals. I'm familiar with, and. Uh, uh, and my academic career is also there. Uh, I'm I'm trained as a IT professional, and uh, those period is very struggling for me. Is the lock tight period? It's also a molding process of myself, and also finding uh, finding my domain and finding my interest, and it's really struggling for me. And after this, I'm slowly step uh, step started to step up and uh, work with uh, work with the community space okay then i find out uh, find uh, travelers university opportunities the livelihood opportunities as my next step of life so i clearly separate these three periods of my life as low tide intertide and high tide periods so ashik next slide yeah, um, here it's an intertidal period of my life. It's a TU journey. And here in this period, uh, when I applied for the TU journey, uh, I have a broad idea, a wide idea about what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm planning to do so much of travel, exploring so much of things, uh, and have a little idea about a livelihood and all. Then, after I started my journey, I slowly uh, experienced and started to understanding about what I am working with uh, and how the community is and the different systems they are following, their beliefs, their rituals and all. These are the key uh, points I tried to explore in my whole journey from different five days. And the domain is climate change, impact, resilience, uh, in Indian coastal communities. And the resilience is a umbrella term. And uh, in that umbrella term, I try to include these all terminologies and more than this, but uh, my limitation and so some unexpected incidents, uh, I have to cut down these two, these points. And we can go through all, each of the points. Mm. First is the adaptation means if there is a climate crisis or climate change is happening continuously, how the community is adapting to such a situation? Uh, in that, uh, uh, many, uh, I can choose Narmada as a, the banks of Narmada as an example for this adaption. And uh, it's also a combination of advocacy also. And uh, I especially want to note that, uh, or I tried to find all of my parandes as uh, from the community. The people from the community is working for themselves, working for the com community. Is uh, I felt they are better by means they are uh, best parandes in my domain because they know the struggle, what how much it is, and the depth of the struggle. And 
mm, all these i if i separately it all goes to all these points i i am also feeling confused now because my all parents are doing all these yes and uh, in this i can especially not the pastoralism as a solution because uh, pastoralism is a uh, i learned pastoralism uh, i can't say learned i just observed and experienced a few learned days with the pastoral community of kutch gujarat and they are moving according to the climate and according to the resource availability and uh, according to the wind and uh, rain and the uh, uh, position of the sun they are moving continuously and is a mobile community and it's, a, it's we can also call it as a seasonal migration and why we are no why we are sticking on one position the whole journey of our life we can also move if there is we can work on the climate change but also we can move why we are sticking on and one means <laughs> one place and one destination uh, we are also have to mold ourselves to uh, to and anyway there is a, there's a climate climate crisis we have to uh, means i agree that uh, yes and uh, yes uh, the sustainable lifestyle of pastoral communities also be a good uh, give a good vision for me also uh, and next we can come to the natural solution that's a, my first domain i am trying to find the natural solutions in any everywhere but i failed uh, i can say failed because we can propose a natural solution to all solutions to all problems uh, because the problem is beyond our control both the natural uh, hazards and anthropological issues and uh, the uh, developmental countries every uh, there is um, a network of problems and the solution is very limited and uh, i try to find some natural solutions through um, a mangroves and some other species mangrove associates and it was my narrow idea about how can i propose a, to a solution to a this much big issue but this is also realization realization through my journey we can propose uh, we can go move for, forward only with the natural solution <laughs> and in advocacy uh, i am experienced advocacy in, with the advocate kamlesh he is from baruch uh, he is from the badbud village of uh, so it's near to surat it's also in gujarat and he is from the community he uh, he is the only one educated and working in the mainstream the so called mainstream as an advocate but his family is still uh, doing the fishing and uh, mar fish markets working with the fish market and he is working with working for the his community without taking any advantage of money or anything he has spent most of his time for this community <laughs> and this is a new learning for me how can use our education our qualification and our network and connections for the community and we are um, spending I mean ourselves for the community yeah and uh, in the education center i am uh, interacted with cacf and sindhu media napoleon who is she is my parent there in trivandrum kerala kerala and uh, the csef is coastal students cultural forum and uh, they are educating and they are helping the students of coastal community uh, to know in their problem to understand to build understand about their problem and also how to they can collaborate with the community if there is a clear separation happening between the un, uh, generation gap we can call that generation gap the uneducated parents and the educated children and they this uh, gap gap filling and building bridges is very important 
recently because the education it can also change the problems so the bridge uh, building of the bridge is uh, happening through this education yeah and uh, yeah that's one and i am also looking into the intersections of uh, different area uh, in all my journey uh, because my uh, reason, when i start my journey i have small idea about well, who are my parents because i am finding next parent day in after complete is in the last days of one place i am uh, reaching and my parents are in different sectors not only from the fisherman community there is a uh, hmm, uh what is this stereotype that pe people living in the coastals all are fisher belongs to the fisher but here i intentionally try to break that concept also because my one by the miss indubaria netball is only from the fisherman community and all are working with uh, working with different different sectors and uh farming people are there and fishing fishing uh fishing i am linked with the fishing community and fishing is very directly connected with the sea and farming is uh, the low tide high tide area waves is uh, connected with the farming and uh, as water salinity when the salinity increases the farming will affected and these intersections are very insightful and the tourism tourism is uh, really thoughtful about my journey uh, i experienced tourism intersection in gogarna and my parent there there is mr uh, miss pankaja and she is working with how coastal uh, tribes uh, otherwise coastal community is uh, uh, is displaced or for displaced uh, during the means when tourism implementation and uh, tourism uh, in the tourism implementation and uh, every government it is as tourism as the future of india and future of every state we can only grow through, through tourism what is what is happening behind the tourism implementation what is happening to the community where they are migrating what they are doing now these all are the questions remaining in front of us but we are not answering to that and we are proposing more tourism project and more, gives more lands to the tourism projects and uh, in the intersection of gender uh, out of five parades three are men and two are two are women and whenever uh, if if my parent is a man i have a strong connection with the woman in their family in their community also and the children also so i had more conversation with the uh, woman uh, i can really uh, understand and i really want to understand what what they are going through what their problem is actually is and how they are dividing their uh, kitchen walls and after that what they are engaged in what their mm, free time engagements and all and uh, uh, pathetically i understand that it's a patriarchal system uh, existing here and money goes to men and uh, women are living under under the control uh, of men rituals and the power of money and resource resources also holding by men so in the case of gender i feel uh, more disappointment uh, but uh, also observed that in the earlier stages uh, of early stages of two or three generations before there is a good uh, participation of men and women in the resources they have <laughs> they have a good uh, communication and the participation in on the inside the family and also in the uh, work workplace okay and uh, rituals yeah this this journey is also break my concept about rituals also because i thought that all rituals are related to the uh, something devotional and the god and things also but uh, the rituals is also give some positive things to the society and to the uh, ecosystem also 
This I learned from the Guneri village of Gujarat. They are conserving the mangroves uh, and they believe that it's a very ancestral one. And there is so many stories behind this that also the, uh, some god is, the Mamai mother is <laughs> uh, gifted that mangroves them. On that belief, they are conserving the mangroves and uh, the land is uh, completely preserved. It's conserved uh, without fencing and the uh, and in the uh, deep uh, uh, deep of summer and if there is no water in the whole village they will never uh, cut the branches of this uh, uh, mangroves and never ne never destroy it no man means each single person from the village is believed that it's from the and uh, gift from the ancestors And um, about the caste system, yeah, that is the common thing I I can uh, clearly observe from each, uh, means wherever I uh, went and stayed, people living in the uh, fossils are always marginalized and belongs to the so-called law caste. And they are feeling... Mm. So many, what we say, and this uh, the law caste community lives in the coastals, and slowly there is a belief. Believes not, uh, the system tells them, them that you all belongs to the lower caste the, because of the uh, you are residing in this kind of uh, uh, climate means vulnerable geography and they have no access to the other means they are slow, uh, strongly connected with the geography also and they have their own belief system and uh, after the one second, uh, I think uh, the caste system is more complicated to explain in such a small uh, time span. So uh, I can move to next slide. This picture is what my mind is now it's only a skeleton because uh, i'm experimenting and experiencing myself and i'm strengthening to strengthening this form and i'm trying to form uh, form myself yeah and uh, through this journey i'm also understanding about my vulnerabilities and my strengths also and uh, so many experience in the journey, uh, uh, some sexual harassment and a physical harm, everything is there. And I thought that I I can only survive in my comfort zone, but it's not like that. Uh, I've also proved myself. I can do this and I can support myself. If, and it's a solo journey. Yeah. Uh, and... I'm the only person is there for me or that's a uh, that's a strong belief comes to my mind and uh, I all always have all that uh, strength in there and I, I also started to believe people and if uh, they are also there for me and they are offering so many things and so many support system for me also and but also I have to build myself I have to build my strength also yeah both are happening parallelly and this is happened to this journey and the identity crisis i'm a person coming from a Dalit background so many questions come from different angles and they want to know the hierarchy they have a hierarchy system in their mind and they have to they are trying to place where i am and the question about a woman woman traveler is a big question in arising in every everyone's mind why you are not traveling with the uh, men 
or a group of people while you're traveling alone. The uh, question is about the identity and uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's really hurt, it's really painful, but it's also a, giving an insight to the uh, insight and giving strength also. And this journey is also experimenting myself. I did uh, many new things. I tried photography. I did uh, the sand art and uh, doing macrame. And I'm also finding something inside me uh, as an artist or as a facilitator or as a storyteller, many things, many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a high tide area. It's my vision, actually. It's something I plan to my future. And uh, it's, I'm very hopefully looking at into this. And I write only three points. I'm only that first one is I, how can I combine my passion about my art and the conservation? And the conservation is only about uh, the ecosystem, it's about the indigenous knowledge and the knowledge about the uh, the sea and uh, about the climate, uh, weather forecasting, about the climate, about the fishing, everything. Uh, no, everything means everything related to the ocean because that is, I am strongly bonded with the ocean. And uh, and through art, I think I can mo more <laughs> represent these, uh, these things and without language barrier. These dual journeys, I struggle a lot because of language. Then I choose art. Art can art have no language. It's a and it's have no barriers. It can reach everywhere. And uh, if I'm not there, somebody can uh, interpret what my art. Yeah, and the livelihood practice. I'm also. Uh, how to practice what I experienced in my old journey after this. And uh, how to give a good structure, good space, and how to start my practice as a livelihood practitioner. And also do uh, also understand the importance of research. And uh, in it's also clubbing of my academic as a social worker into a researcher because uh, whenever we say it, it's an indigenous knowledge, it's a traditional knowledge, we need a scientific background of of this uh, this knowledge system. So trying to uh, study it more and in the new uh, in the current scenario, what is happening, what is happened to the sea and what is happened to the happening to the climate, and clubbing these two uh, factors into a uh, in in the research research model. And how to build uh, more uh, more resources through the resource it's through research, yeah. Yeah, this is I'm trying to say. <laughs> I think I conveyed, and there is little bit of nervousness over <laughs> missing of some words. Yeah, I I agree with my limitations. And uh, there is some photo gallery. I uh, I took the from some photos from. I selected a few photos from my. I took in my all journey, and there is some stories behind this every photo. Uh, this is a, a famous Legbert port. It's an ancient port in Legbert, and you can see some sea. Uh, you can feel the sea, but there is no sea. Yeah. And there is some small, uh, yeah, some small water spaces there. And these cows are go, cows and camels go there and having water and coming back. Next, yeah, this is a, uh, I, this is a, a photo from the same uh, near to the Lakeport port also, uh, port. And uh, this lady is uh, daughter of my. Pirinde, first Pirinde. And she is always, she is in 23 now. So I can't say the Didi. 
but she every time i used to say call me didi because i am married and all this is related to the ritual she is doing some ganga puja in that lakpat fort Mm, this uh, home I stayed in touch and I call, named it as a home without doors because nothing is there as precious and all are welcome to that homes. You can see other homes also there which have no doors. Yeah, it's a it's made of bunny grass. Huh, yeah, and it denotes the water scarcity of Kutch and. the you can see the stream not stream some uh, water near the near the road and we are drinking that water that uh, mud and uh, mud kind of water we are drinking and uh, these uh, these most are uh, girls are in teenagers and they are here to collect the water pond and this photo is from narmada the river mouth of narmada in bahut it's in the evening after the sunset i took after they are, they coming back from coming back from fishing after fishing and the boat are kept there yeah it's a construction happening in bahut the big barrage is constructing across the narmada river Ah, uh, this is live on wheels. So oh God, their caravans, their utensils, their stuff, their livestock. Yeah. Uh, this is ah uh, the famous tourism destination Gokarna, and ah uh, the ladies here are coastal tribes, the Siddhi community. Initially, they were they are engaged in fish fishing related jobs. and now they are sending uh, the flowers especially the lotus in the pilgrimage destination because they lost their lands in the because of the tourism and they are migrated from the beaches and they are residing in the eastern parts of the gokarna now and this is how man treats treats the beaches and these pictures are from trivandrum uh, uh near to the vinyam project and how the coastal erosion and it's a combination of uh, anthropological means the human induced hazard and the climate change uh, the coastal erosion is happening there from last many years and the people are losing their homes continuously now i think it's the sixth line of the home the remaining part is already see taken the windows this is this is uh, how i everyone vision when we open the window we can see the sea but here we can see the window and the sea together yeah this is uh, how everywhere if there is a sea erosion coastal erosion happening everybody everybody suggests that if we need a sea wall this is how sea wall treats us cost separate the beach and the sea it's a clear separation and the tide tide strongly hits the sea wall and you can see a boat it's come hit on the sea wall and it's damaged i don't know what happened to the fisherman of the boat this is uh, this is a kid from the puwa village of trivandrum and the parents strongly believes that uh, i am there to help them and they gave they gave this kid to me and we started to play and all other people are left that that they believe people it's a strong if, if we are giving our kid to an to a stranger and uh, <coughs> and the parents are not there that much believe they have themselves means on others and they are, this kid is really engaging and he is explaining the parts of boat to me this is uh, it's his uh, dad and uncle's boat 
and he is explaining this is uh, the hook, this is the net. Uh, future fisherman. It's the Mudalapuri Harbor. And uh, here in this uh, curve, 65 people lost their lives because of this unplanned construction of this uh, harbor. And in, it's not, it's in a purely in an inappropriate place. And when in the high tide time, there is a mud, uh, mud deposition and uh, the height of the tide will be increasedly automatically. And boats can never enter into the, it's very difficult to enter into this uh, harbor at the high tide, I mean, high tide time and in the climate is in bad. Uh, I think recently, uh, very a few months before, uh, there is few people lost, and in the whole history of this harbor, about sixty five people lost their lives. Just they have reached the uh, here, but they lost. It's not happening in the deep sea or mm -hmm. without any information system. Is nothing like that. It's just happening in front of our, our eyes. This is uh, the clathi fish of. Uh, Karingulam. Yeah. It's really tasty. And <laughs> yeah, I already, means I had tasted it before. And it's dried, preparing for dry fishes. This is the major income of the woman in the places. Yeah. The serving. This is sea net. Yeah, it's a view from the Veli Craft Village. And I invite all to see the sea and to see the lives and the life behind the life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Vaishna, for that like from the heart presentation and sharing. Uh, yeah, so we are open to Q&A as usual. Hi, Vaishna. Okay. Hi, Yeah, can I go or is there some question that's coming in? I... No, you, you, can, you can share first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, thank you for this engaging, very engaging uh, sharing, Vaishna. And uh, there was this one part I particularly uh, felt that I, um, uh, yeah, about, about the tourism. Yeah. I have had similar uh, experiences around where uh, tourism has come as a as a solution to adapt to climate change, but uh, tourism itself is making the place or area uh, devastated further. So um, yeah, I was curious which uh, watch I mean what such uh, um area did you come across and what was your experience around it like okay so the uh, uh tourism for me is not a solution for for something it's not it's a, another business it's an, another part, face of a corporate and uh we can say that is a responsible tourism and tourism participation but later, it anyway goes to uh, in the hand of some corporates, and uh, the land also goes to belongs to somebody else, and uh, uh, they never treats uh, they dehumanize the community who resides there, who are, who actually owns that land, and it's com completely into a business kind of thing, 
and uh, the construction of the buildings, especially the construction of the buildings, they are made, the resort, the shacks, in anything. That is not uh, considering the geography and the wind and the, uh, 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 <coughs> the type of the sand and different factors in the geographical factors and the ecological factors, uh, things. It's uh, it's their vision something, and they are implementing something. It's not into the lock. It's not localized one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I also uh, strongly agree with this. But uh, sometimes I also wonder if at all they stick to the ethics of so-called, uh, you know, eco-tourism or sustainable tourism. Okay, not the greenwashing part of it. But uh, do you think that if, we, if they follow the uh, principles and stick to the moralities of it, uh, that is going to be, uh, that is any um, going to benefit these communities in any way? Oh, I mean, your view. I never observed the responsible tourism in a visible manner anywhere. Because uh, very few people is practicing this, and there is no support system for them also. And uh, they, it's following the following the uh, sustainable way and uh, responsible eco conservation way is very and equitable. That we also have to coin the term equitable way is very difficult, and the people who is running tourism is have to survive. That is also there. And both are not doing going parallelly. It's my observation. I Th thanks, thanks, Vashna. Yeah, that was insightful. So there's a question from Sanju. Is there any reason why you chose a Western coast? Okay, uh, Sanju, I actually I have a plan of both covering Western Coastals and Eastern Coastals. I have to start from Gujarat and I, I have to end in Kolkata. But due to some uh, uncertain things happened in my journey, I took a break from Kanyakumari where I, that is my last destination. But after this, I will continue my journey to the Eastern Coastals also. There's another question in the comment. Uh, what is the pastoral view of time and space? Uh, I didn't get you. Can I speak? Uh, there's a question in the comment. Uh, what is the pastoral view of time and space? Pastoral view of time and space? Uh, it's not uh, the calendar thing of one. It's a uh, it's biological or ecological calendar they are following and uh, it's according to the uh, availability of resources. They are mainly uh, the camel herders and some light livestock they have, the pastoral community and it's more, they give more preference to their livestock and uh, according to the availability of the water, water is more important in every life. So we can move according to the resource availability and where we are comfortable and where we need have more less suffering less suffering and more resourceful this kind of movement is all, all that is already we have practice in the shift, shift cultivation also it's another kind of uh, movement is happening and it's also time for the previous place where that we are residing and nurture themselves we are uh, giving that time and times for that place for nurture themselves and uh, for more creepers is there and more what we say um, if we, if you are uh, harvest something uh, from continuously from a land the land destroys destroys and if you are uh, doing it in a periodical way we will get more yield this kind of way, uh, the pastoral community is also following. Uh, they are moving, uh, it, but they are moving in a very large scale. They are moving uh, some 200 kilometers in each uh, each cycle. And uh, the simplicity of their lives also, 
because they only have the things uh, in, that we can tie in the uh, as a bundle. Only a single bundle, they can tie all their homes, their uh, their savings, their whole life. Yeah. There's another question from Sushrutan. Can you tell the experience you had at Narmada River Banks? Uh, well, Can you tell the experience you had at Narmada River Banks? Uh, Narmada River Banks, yeah. Narmada River Banks is uh, really Mm. insightful also and it's also painful one is also one uh, I'm living with the community they have no no feel of the community no there is no community feel themselves and only they belongs to the machi community they are they, they resides in one geographical area that is the that is the only thing they are connected and uh the belief system in them uh mm. And uh, in Narmada, I stayed with the uh, person Kalpesh uh, with uh, with, the, with his family. And one Baba comes. Uh, Kalpesh was initially a fisherman, and one Baba said to him that uh, you are really a carpenter. You have good skills in carpenting. You have to do carpenting, and you can earn more. Then he, uh, for him, it's a word from the board. Then he changed he changed his life as a carpenter and uh, the belief that uh, carpenting is uh, something higher than fishing fishing is something uh, what non fair or something some kind of job and he chose uh, as they started his life as a carpenter the second part of his life as a carpenter and this kind of belief is slowly uh, started to spread among the all the community and uh, Mm -hmm. That uh, that that kind of uh, beliefs also there and the constructions. Uh, I mean, there is a hard part also there uh, because of these corporates, the in industrial area, and uh, how they made uh, the, uh, this community as a marginalized and uh, geographically vulnerable. Uh, it's it's need more time to explain all the Narmada experiences, but. Uh, when I uh, specific to the community, hmm. uh, uh, this is my experience. Okay, there's a question from Magnus. Hi, Vaishna. Such a lovely presentation. So happy to see you. My question is, how did the depletion in marine resources and species richness affect the coastal community, especially coastal women? Do you find any special observations or patterns throughout the Western coast? I need one, one minute to process. Yeah, yeah. I think question. you can also read the question on your screen. Yeah. And... Okay. Yeah. This the uh, this thing I observed in my journey because uh in uh in the fishing, coastal women have a good uh good role in the case in the case of marketing. And making the dry fishers and selling the dry fishers, they are all they are also uh, earning some income. And uh, when the depletion happened in the uh, in, in the case of fishing, uh, men uh, men uh, usually turn into an another jobs. In the only the season time they will engage in fishing. In another period they will turn into another other kind of jobs. And women can't participate in that kind of jobs. It's a physically. Uh, 
uh, more uh, effort, some hard work jobs, and women is usually not participating in it, and women do en engage in their uh, kitchen works, and they are limiting themselves. And uh, the family structure also uh, uh, changes according to the availability of fishes and the resources. And uh, men have to work the whole year for earning some money. And if uh, if there is a good fishing at the time, they can earn whatever they want in the seasonal time. And the rest of the time, uh, they have they can engage in other works and other other. Uh, what kind of uh, enjoyments and everything is there and in uh, fishing is goes less and the climate is also affecting if there are one year there is uh, more I think uh, if there is the warning is coming fish, fisherman, fisherman never goes to the sea uh, because they are uh, afraid of the climate also the fear in about the climate is also there uh, and they think twice or thrice about oh if something is happen to happening in the sea, the cyclone will come or something will happen and some high tide will there is there or not. And the number of fishing days has also decreased. It's also affecting the woman. And uh, they are all for them if there are some woman is marketing uh, means marketing the fishes, they also need to pay higher amount to hire the I means buy the fishes from the fisherman and to sell in the market. The cycle is also continuously changing according to the availability of fishes. But the struggle, finally the struggle goes to the woman, the person who is handling the family and Agnes, I think I tried to convey what you Next question is from Susan. Yeah, so Susan says, like, adding to what you already shared about the sea and your connection, I would like mm -hmm. to know what the future holds for coastal communities as an as in livelihood and their social fabric. I'm, it's also a question mark in my mind. It's not in my, in every person who are engaged with the coastal community, what is the future of uh, the fisherman? Because uh, the climate is changing uh, day by day and we can't predict the weather. So people are, the youngsters, especially the youngsters, he started to uh, try to go see for fishing. So uh, there is a good uh, number of de number of decreases in the young fishermen happening in day by day, and uh, they are engaging in some other kind of jobs, and they are also trying to educate it and finding some other jobs. And in Kerala context, they are going to abroad, and uh, I'm confused about the other regions, but they are uh, withdraws from the from the fishing fishing. Uh, and uh, some he's asking about some other livelihood. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> that they up to them. They have to mold themselves as to to find their livelihood. I'm not. I can't suggest and I can't predict what it is. Mm -hmm. But I can. I can only observe what is happening in them. Thank you, Agnes. Any more questions or anything that you would like to share? Okay. Yes. 
Pruthi has a question in the comments. Do you also plan to extend your journey on looking at climate change impacting the high altitude or other bioregions? So apart from the coastal regions, any other bioregions that you're interested in exploring or studying? Actually, still now I have no plans about uh, high altitudes and bioregions because it's very difficult more for me to understand what is happening in high altitude. I, if I'm in, I reading some article or something about the high altitude or about the Himalayan region, I started to compare with the coastals. This is continuously happening in me. So, from my experience from my childhood, what I learned and what I experiencing, it's easily it's easy and it's uh, very uh, related to very personal. I can. Uh, I can easily understand and uh, understand what is happening to the coastals. But uh, for me, high altitude is an extreme strange something for me. And I never started to uh, <clears throat> learn about those places. And my travels and my uh, exposure and experiences, everything is about to the coastals. So... I plan to continue my journey and my livelihood practice in the coastals. That's a question from this room, mm -hmm. uh, from Sreshta. She's asking about uh, how I'm going to club the uh, uh, climate change and caste gender in one in my frame. Yeah, uh, usually uh, the first priority is go, uh, in the climate change, but uh, it's when we come to the community, it it's important to that we have to address what is uh, what the system means the what the gender system they are following means uh, who have the priorities and who is suppressed. We have to address that, and it's our responsibility to that. We have to stand with the oppressed, and we have to work from them. We have to start our work from them, and it's have to mention their sufferings in all the what we are preparing or what we are doing. We have to mention, and we have to work for them. And uh, the caste system is I always engage with, uh, in my whole journey. In my life journey and also the uh, a TU journey also, and uh, it's uh, India is a caste existing country and it's it, the caste system is built. Uh, the strength is increasing day by day. That we are very visible, and we have to address, and we have we have to uh, work on it in a different thing nowadays, and. Uh, People who are belongs to uh, anyway they are residing in the uh, coastals are uh, the uh, one way it's a fisherman or some way it's a marginalized anyway it's a marginalized community who are residing there and uh, at the final they belongs to the lower caste the so called lower caste and we have to build the uh, beliefs in themselves they are, have uh, the self esteem we have to build the self esteem in them they are not uh, they are not not in the lower part of the hierarchy. If there is a hierarchy, they have a particular position, not in the lower, middle, higher something is not there, because they are str uh, struggling with the climate, struggling with the sea. That is not nobody can. Uh, nobody can can mention it. Uh, uh, nobody can go forward without mentioning it. That's so important factor. I. And uh, the mental strength and the physical strength they have, 
and the observations the knowledge system they build is not simple that is the that they made uh, that their uh, means we say ground of their caste not the uh, chaturvarna or upper lower caste thing that this kind of uh, strength we have to build among them and we have to strengthen them with they will strength we have to support them that is thing Yes, that's a question from Sanju. Yes, yeah, Sanju has asked, with the learnings and experience you had, how, how are you planning to give back to the coastal communities? Yeah, it's a... I also have a, some sketches about it. Uh, I think I shared something in my uh, high tide part. Uh, I want to focus my completely into one community and I have to build uh, uh, I have to I can't say build or uh, uh, mm, what <laughs> there is no particular word I have to mm, uh, stay for a long time that's a bet better thing uh, because building a some community is not up to me and I have to spend my few years with a community and I really want to experience and uh, learn from them and uh, well it's also have to be I, I want to document them and their stories their struggles and their historical parts and everything and it will be in Kerala uh, because uh, in the past the past step I have I'm planning to uh, spend my few years in Kerala and most probably it will be in the uh, castle Road region because uh, there there are the Kasselgood is the less explored district of Kerala. So, uh, and also I have to uh, experiment with my art skills with this learning system. And also I have a plan about uh, builded, uh, means uh, molded tourism model also. And uh, this combination, uh, combination of these trees, I'm really wanted to do with the coastal communities and with the community participation and community engagement I am also wish to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Maybe we can take one or two more questions if there are. Okay, looks like there aren't more questions. So I think we can close with that. Thank you, Vaishna. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for hearing me. And thanks to all the friends who joined, like via Zoom and also via like who are who are joined in person at Bhumi College. Um so tomorrow we have the uh, the the next the remaining three presentations by our fellows, uh, starting from like ten thirty in the morning, uh, and like till three thirty. So tomorrow we have the Via who explored the area of arts arts for social change, Aditya Singh who explored the topic of agriculture and food system, and Streshta who explored the domain of alternatives in education, art, and social emotional learning. Uh, so thanking you once again and also welcoming you to, for the sessions tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks a lot.